What makes video games unique? Interactivity, control, power over what happens on the screen. To create the best games, you need to know how to balance power and control, and the player needs to see the difference that he or she makes. So, who's got the pants? What? Hey, honey, have you seen my pants? What do you mean? I'm the one who wears the pants around here. Hey, those are mine. Do you want power? Who doesn't want power? Everyone wants at least some degree of power. When we're talking about video games, we're talking about power control. We're talking about something completely different than when you normally talk about power control. First, let's define control. Control is the number of choices that you make in a video game. Take a game like Super Smash Bros. Have you heard of it? If you haven't, I want to see your ID to check if you're from Planet Earth. Super Smash Bros. is a fighting game where you can use lots of different Nintendo characters to brawl it out in many different stages. It's really fun and takes a lot of skill and challenge to be good at it. The game has a lot of control because there's lots of choices you can make at any given millisecond in the gameplay. But let me ask you this, what if the choices that you made had absolutely no effect on the game? Well you wouldn't be playing a game, right? You'd just be watching a movie. Power is the effect that your choices have on the game. Examples of games with a lot of power are chess, strategy games, or even a game like Pac-Man. Super Smash Bros. has a lot of power, and this makes it an engaging game because you can see the effects that your choices have on the gameplay. This also allows the game to have a level of strategy that is not matched by many other games. This is the power and control balance. It's a figure that I made that represents the balance between power and control in regard to video games. The ideal thing is to have power equal control, but on the scale power is always equal to or less than control, and here's the reason why. Control is the input, and power is the effect of that input. Every choice that you make has some kind of effect, whether it's a maximum effect, a minimum effect, or somewhere in between. And the power is the measure of that effect, so it, it can be maximum, which is equal to control, or less than the control. Our physical world can serve as another ideal for the game world. In our physical world, the things we do are governed by laws such as the law of gravity and the laws of thermodynamics. Everything we do is within these laws. Every single choice that we make in this world has some kind of effect, even if it's really small. So when applying realism to games, we can try to aim for that same effect. In fact, realism is something that many developers are trying to apply to games today. When you have a near balance of power and control, another thing that happens is the potential for depth. This is because almost every choice you make has an effect on the game, so you have to learn what choices to make and when. This takes a lot of learning. A more immediate effect of an imbalance or balance of power control is a feeling of fairness or unfairness when playing. Say if you keep losing a level over and over, you might think it's not fair. But really what might be happening is not that your choices have no effect, but that you're making the wrong choices. In this case, the game's learning curve is at fault. The game should be doing a better job of showing you where you're making mistakes and help you to improve. The practical way that I see the balance and control ratio in retail games today is that some games have a really close balance of power and control and that everything you do matters, such as a strategy game like I mentioned earlier. But most games just have an adequate balance of power and control, but they could be better. Games that are based on chance also have an imbalance of power and control because a random event can make your past decisions fruitless. For example, the game Sorry is a quite a fun game, but it's based a great deal on chance. However, power and control are something that you should consider when you're making a video game. Alright, if you're not a Smash fan, just bear with me for a little more. I just have one more thing to say about the game. If you've ever played it, you know that you can use wacky weapons to fight other characters. You can either turn the weapons off, or you can leave them on. If you turn the weapons on, what happens is that weapons will randomly appear at different positions in the stage at different times. What this does is creates an unfair advantage for a player because the puzzle weapon appears right next to a player. He can pick up that weapon for the current time has an unfair advantage over you. This creates an imbalance in the power control scale, where suppose if you were playing around where there were no weapons, it would be all up to your strategy and decisions to win the game or lose. Hey, wait a minute, wait a Wh minute. That's not what power is. Ben, what are you doing? Power is the ability to influence others. Specifically, according to the famous sociologist Max Weber, Power is the ability to bring about one's will over the will of others. According to Weber, social stratification is based upon three variables. Ben, stop. I'm doing a video. I'm just trying to help. That's not the kind of power I'm talking about. Please let me do this alone. I read. That's my sibling's baby doll. Anyway. 
So can you think of any games that you've played with a good or poor power and control balance? Right, like I'm actually going to give you enough time to think. And maybe if this was a preschool cartoon, I'd be generous enough to give you two seconds to answer. Anyway, let me show you how you as a developer can practically put gravity on a player's decisions. One way you can do this is by integrating a physics engine into your game. This basically takes all the physical laws from the real world and puts it into a video game, but it's not quite as complex. This is Roblox. It's an MMOG that was made several years ago and is still in operation today. In Roblox, you can make your own games and you can play games that other people have played in a Lego style world. This particular game that I'm playing in this video is called Plane Wars. And because of the physics engine, some really wacky things can happen every once in a while. This actually makes the game fun, and the physics engine facilitates mastery of the game. There are more simplistic ways to form an optimal power and control balance, although integrating a physics engine isn't as challenging as it used to be. You don't have to program one from scratch anymore. You can put timing challenges into your game, which are those challenges that require a player to press a button but just at the right time to get the results they want. You've probably seen this in action game. You can also put in challenges that require lots of knowledge about different things, little details of knowledge that the player learns here and there. Take a look at this video. In this first example, the player swings a sword and hits the enemy. If he misses, nothing happens. If he hits it, he wins. But suppose I edit the game. Now when you slice forward, if you miss, you fall forward and you have to spend time to get back up. If you do a jab back and you're too late, you have to recover. This is an example of little details that you can put in the game that the player has to learn about in order for him to master the game. Going back to the timing decision, you can integrate what I call analogous goals. These are in contrast to all or nothing goals in that there's not simply an end goal. The decisions you make have a minor or major impact. Look in this game example again. Depending on if the player hits the enemy early, just on time or late, he deals more damage. Whereas, if this was an all or nothing goal, the player would just have to hit the enemy, then he'd win. Mastering results from having these types of timing and knowledge challenges in video games and giving the player power like this. This is what makes good games deep. All this type of power control is kind of like handling resources in a business. If you spend enough time refining the game, you can take a really simple game concept and turn it into a complex game. I could talk more about power and control, but this should be enough for now. Remember, power is the effect that your choices have on a video game, and control is the number of different choices that you can make. In this video, I specifically talked about power and guard to end results, but power is also the effect that the player's choices have on the game's story, the audio, the visuals, or any output. So remember, the player, not the game, should be wearing the pants. The player should feel his choices have an impact. Unless the player wears the pants, his attention span will be very, well, brief. What games have you played with great power? Tell me in the survey at the link provided and see the results on next week's video. Thanks for watching. You know, Matt Webber isn't the only major power theorist. C. Wright Miller forged a power elite theory in his book of the same title, which proposed that the majority of power is.